just about everyone involved in bodybuilding or fitness activities, inclu including athletes. Everybody's aware of the importance of protein in the diet. Your muscles are, well, well your muscles are largely composed of water, about 72% water. The solid material in muscle, uh, if you want to call it the actual muscle itself, the muscle tissue, muscle fibers, and connective tissue, is protein. So protein is very important for building and maintaining muscle. Uh, we know that. Now, you, the reason you take protein, uh, eat protein in foods, or take protein supplements, take amino acids, all of this is to help build and maintain muscle. Uh, you know, some amino acids, uh, but there, you know, there, there is every so often you come across articles, uh, especially written by registered dietitians, people that are not actively involved in bodybuilding, but I don't know where they get. You know, they they look at some research that usually involves people that are not active athletes or bodybuilders and they come to conclusions that don't necessarily relate to bodybuilders. For example, you hear a lot about the negative effects of protein. Uh, just to give you a couple of examples, protein reduces bone mass. Years ago they thought that protein could reduce bone mass, possibly even uh, set you up for something like osteoporosis, which is a weakening uh, of the bones with age, more common in women, starts about age 30 becomes apparent by age 60. It can lead to fractures that come out of nowhere, spinal fractures, you know, hip fractures and this and that. Uh, they, the reason that they said that uh, protein causes a loss of bone mass is because protein, uh, a lot of the amino acids are acidic. Uh, after all, amino acid, you know, <laughs> some of them are acidic. And because of that, uh, the body tries to buffer the, the acidity produced in the blood by excess protein and it does so by leaching calcium out of the bones. This was a prevalent uh, theory for a long time until research showed just the opposite effect. It turns out that protein is very good for bone mass because it stimulates insulin-like growth factor 1, which among many other attributes maintains connective tissue and bone mass. So we could toss that one right out the window, this notion that protein is bad for the bones. That's the first one. The second one, and this you hear a lot, you still hear a lot, is protein's bad for the kidneys. <laughs> uh, th this was based on studies of people in hospitals who are on dialysis. They had kidney failure, or people that were on the verge of kidney failure. When your kidneys aren't working, it's true that your, your kidneys cannot handle protein properly because the kidneys are the main excretory organ of amino acid byproducts specifically urea. The liver produces urea as a uh, byproduct of amino acid metabolism. Urea is water soluble and it's secreted through the kidneys. If your kidneys aren't functioning right, it's true the protein can increase kidney stress. Again, the important point being that's a path that's only if you're in a pathological condition, meaning that your kidneys are on the verge of failure or you're already uh, on dialysis, already have kidney failure, then protein's a problem. So this, this notion that protein, it's, it's really silly when you think about it, this notion that protein's bad for the kidneys was based entirely on people with advanced kidney disease. Study after study, including studies with bodybuilders, have shown that even protein intakes as high as five times the suggested amount of protein needed to build muscle has no adverse effect on kidney function. Let me repeat, no adverse effect on kidney function. Some of these studies went on for two years or more. If you have normal functioning kidneys, protein is not a problem. However, to protect your kidneys, you always want to make sure that your blood pressure is controlled because the really, the really damaging thing on the kidneys is not protein, but high blood pressure. High blood pressure slowly destroys the kidneys, the filtering units called the nephrons, so you want to make sure your blood pressure is under control. You also want to make sure you, uh, you uh, do not restrict fluids because when you lower your uh, fluid uh, intake, such as water, you take diuretics or something like that, where you make yourself dehydrated, that causes a lessening of blood volume and your uh, kidneys to work properly have to have a certain amount of blood volume and, and pressure within the kidneys. If they don't, it can cause kidney damage. So do not restrict water. That's one of the main things to protect your kidneys. Another thing you want to do uh, is uh, make sure you get the amino acid arginine and other nitric oxide precursors such as citrulline or beet juice because the nit nitric oxide is extremely protective of kidneys, especially as you age. 
40% of people over the age of 60, I'm sorry, people, uh, <laughs> in people, let me reverse that, people over 60, most of them have 40% of their kidney function left, and this is because of long-term uh, damage to the kidneys that you don't even feel, but a lot of it has to do with a decrease of nitric oxid, oxide production in the blood vessel endothelium. Nitric oxides maintain blood vessel suppleness, flexibility, and that's very important for proper kidney function. Another, another possible uh, often voiced negative effect of protein is dehydration because it does take a lot of water to metabolize protein. However, if you drink enough fluid, water, or you know, fruit juice, well, not fruit juice, that's a refined carbohydrate, but in other words, if you drink enough fluids, dehydration is rare. You know, and this notion that you're going to get dehydrated drinking coffee, that's also been disproven. That's nonsense. So uh, I could sum it up. There's probably a couple of other uh, statements made about why protein's bad, and most of it's bogus nonsense. But there is one modicum of truth, and this is very rarely discussed. Dietitians never talk about this. I first mentioned this in an article in a bodybuilding magazine about 25 years ago when no one else was talking about it. The only people that knew about it were scientists molecular, who studied molecular, molecular physiology and nutrition. This has to do with a substance called the mammalian, now it's called the mechanistic target of rapamycin, or mTOR. mTOR is a pivotal substance involved in muscle protein synthesis. When you ingest amino acids, particularly the branched-chain amino, amino acids, uh, especially leucine. Leucine is the key amino acid to stimulate mTOR. And when you stimulate mTOR, you, you initiate a cascade of, of anabolic signaling factors downstream in muscle that results in increased muscle protein synthesis and an increased muscle size. In fact, and one, of the, one of the mechanisms of anabolic steroid drugs and growth hormone is that it also increases activity of mTOR. mTOR is needed for growth of cells. That sounds good. Now, mTOR, of course, is very important when you're growing. However, when you get older, unfortunately, mTOR can have a reverse effect. mTOR has to be in balance with another protein called AMPK. I'll get to that more in a minute. But what happens is, as you get older, most in a lot of people, mTOR gets out of balance. When it gets out of balance, a lot of bad things can happen, including accelerated aging and a decrease in longevity. In other words, eating a, a high-protein diet when you get go past 40, unless you take measures to kind of neutralize the effect or at least control it, you're shortening your lifespan. I know this is a pretty amazing statement, but a ton of research shows it's true. You've heard of, you've probably heard that caloric restriction or reducing your total caloric intake by an average of 30 percent or more uh, actually uh, is uh, in most animal species increases lifespan. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons it does that is that it uh, decreases uh, the activity of mTOR and it increases another process called autophagy, which I'll get to that in a minute also. Now, uh, uh, but of course, not too many people can handle caloric restriction. It's basically a starvation diet. Uh, it's not good for bodybuilding because you, you get a lowering of testosterone and all anabolic hormones, except, strangely enough, IGF-1, which is kind of a mysterious thing. But uh, uh, mTOR... Uh, uh, again, the name of it is called the mechanistic target of rapamycin. What is rapamycin? Rapamycin was discovered in a fungus on uh, Rapa, Rapa Island, better known as Easter Island. It was discovered in the soil, and it turns out that uh, it was named rapamycin because it was discovered on Easter Island. Like I say, the native term for Eastern Island, Easter Island is Rapa Rapa, so they called it rapamycin. Rapamycin actually uh, it blocks mTOR. Uh, they use it in medicine as, as an immunosuppressant drug. For example, if you have a kidney transplant, a lot of times they'll give you rapamycin to prevent your body from rejecting the uh, donated organ. But uh, uh, when used as a drug, uh, rapamycin, by inhibiting mTOR, several studies uh, have shown that it could possibly be a life-extending drug. So thus far, I think most of the studies have shown this, have, have shown that if you give uh, rapamycin to dogs, it increases the lifespan of the dogs an average of three years. Now that's a lot. That's equivalent to about 30 years of human life. Uh, again, again, uh, a little bit more about rapamycin later, but uh, uh, there's, there's several reasons why 
mTOR, uh, you know, uh, can uh, speed up the aging process. For one, you know, I mentioned this process called autophagy. Autophagy involves the clearing out of old, beaten up, dead cells called senescent cells. The problem with senescent cells is these are cells that have stopped replicating. The problem is uh, mTOR causes them to, to become something called, and I have, I've, this is a little bit hard to remember, it's called the, the, uh, uh, the uh, secretory phenotype, uh, 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 secretary, um, anyway, it's called SAPS, SAPS, senescent cells. But what they do is they secrete inflammatory chemicals that stimulate systemic inflammation, which again speeds up the aging process. And uh, mTOR stimulates uh, the uh, cells to become uh, senescent, uh, and, it, and it blocks autophagy, which it, which would be would be the process of clearing out these uh, senescent cells. And by doing so, it, it stimulates rapid aging. Uh, mTOR also uh, it tends to uh, block uh, the uh, the uh, activation of stem cells, which are cells that are that are uh, let's say kind of replacement cells. They the cells that can be used to uh, kind of supplement normal cells. Uh, for example, in your muscles, you have stem cells called satellite cells. When the muscle is damaged, these satellite cells are recruited and they donate uh, a, 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 nucle a myonucleus, a nuclei, and basically they uh, make a long story short, stem cells are involved in increased muscle protein synthesis and in the repair and growth of cells. However, uh, mTOR in excess actually blocks stem cells. And that's another way that it speeds the, the aging process. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the other substance I talked about, AMPK, AMPK is in, in considered an energy sensor in muscle. It, it's the yin to mTOR's yang. In other words, uh, AMPK works in reverse. It, it actually kind of opposes muscle protein synthesis, but it stimulates autophagy. It stimulates the use of fat as energy in muscle. It does a number of good things. But when you get older, the balance between mTOR and AMPK goes out of whack in favor of mTOR, and that's what stimulates a lot of the uh, effects of aging. If you could keep them in balance, then, well, then you would get the benefits of both. If you can keep mTOR in balance with AMPK, you would still get the, uh, the muscle building and muscle maintenance effects of mTOR, but you'd also get the, uh, the longevity effects of AMPK. So how do you do that? Okay, there's a couple of nutrients that are known to modify uh, uh, AM. Uh, I'm sorry, to modify mTOR. Now this is very important because any of you who are involved in bodybuilding, especially if you're uh, past the age of 40, this could be extremely important. This could extend your life. If you stay on a high protein diet and don't take these kind of measures, you're going to be your, your mTOR is going to go, go go up with age anyway, and the, the ingestion of of, uh, of of large amounts of protein. Is going to uh, it's, it's like putting oil on a fire. It's going to make it much worse. Now, of course, you don't want to cut down your protein. It's kind of a dilemma because you don't want to cut down your protein as you get older because then you open yourself up to a uh, what they call sarcopenia, which is a loss of muscle mass with age. A lot of older people that don't consume enough protein, they get sarcopenia, they lose muscle mass. That creates a whole another problem uh, related to health, frailty, and also increases mortality. So again, you want to have the best of both worlds. You want to have maximum muscle health and maximum, uh, let's say, metabolic health through AMPK. So what can you do? One way around that, you probably heard some of you who are more into science, you might have heard there's a drug that's often given to people with prediabetes, insulin sensitivity called metformin. Metformin stimulates AMPK. Several studies have shown that, uh, giving, that uh, metformin actually it seems to be able to extend longevity. And the reason it does is because it will, it, will low, it will lower the effects of mTOR while stimulating AMPK. However, metformin is a drug. It, it usually has very few side effects. Some people can't handle it. It can cause gastrointestinal symptoms. I myself have been using mTOR for at least two, I, I'd estimate about 18 years. I've never had any problem. I don't take a lot of it. I take 500 milligrams twice a day. Uh, I take it because I'm, in, I'm insulin insensitive. However, <laughs> when this data came out about the life extension, possible life extension benefits of mTOR, I decided to keep taking it anyway, even if I didn't have insulin sensitivity. So what I'm saying is I would take mTOR even if I had no problems with insulin at all because of its possible life extending benefits and because of the fact that I've never experienced any side effects from it. But let's say you don't want to use drugs. You don't want to take mTOR. 
what natural substances will help you control mTOR where you, uh, where you can get the benefits of mTOR without negating the protein synthesis benefits. There's a couple of them. One of them is called fisetin. Fisetin is a flavanol, and it's found naturally in strawberries, apples, onions, and cucumbers. It's also in available in, in, a, in a, I'm sorry, supplement form. And uh, what this uh, fisetin is about is in, fi a combination of fisetin and another nutrient called quercetin has been found extremely effective in helping the body clear out senescent cells. In other words, this uh, combination of fisetin and quercetin can actually uh, will actually slow down the aging process. In other words, you know, I'm not going to say it's going to make you look like you're 19 if you're 70 years old, but it will definitely slow down the aging of cells by helping the body get rid of these senescent cells, which are just garbage that piles up in the body and mucks up the normal cellular machinery. Another nutrient, another uh, nutrient or substance, natural substance that helps to control mTOR is curcumin. Curcumin is a product of turmeric, which is a kind of a spice that's found in something called curry, which is widely used in India. Curcumin has, oh my God, so many benefits. Uh, I've written articles about it in my Applied Metabolics newsletter. I can't get into it here. It's way beyond the scope of this video. But what, what you want to know about curcumin related to this is curcumin will also help temper the effects of mTOR. Another substance that you can use is oleopin. It's called oleopin, which is found naturally in extra virgin olive oil. Only found in extra virgin olive oil. It's not found in regular olive oil. It's not found in refined olive oil. It's not found. It's only found in extra virgin olive oil. And this stuff also helps to helps to blunt the effects of mTOR, which will again slow down the aging process. Another popular one: resveratrol. How does resveratrol work? Resveratrol stimulates AMPK, which, I, as I said, AMPK opposes the effects of mTOR. By stimulating a AMPK, you help control mTOR. Just drinking coffee because of the caffeine. Caffeine helps to control mTOR. So just drinking coffee will help you uh, control uh, mTOR. No, no wonder that some recent studies show that coffee definitely helps to increase longevity. Now you know why because it helps to control mTOR. I, I just mentioned quercetin. Quercetin is found naturally in onion, apples, cranberry, and tomatoes. Quercetin, not only does it help get rid of senescent cells, but it also helps to control mTOR. Still another one is found in pomegranate. It's called punicaligin. Punicaligin is a substance found in pom pomegranates, pomegranate juice, also will control mTOR. Another one, another substance, uh, epigallocatechin gallate. Uh, it's also, or EGCG, it's the most active polyphenol in green tea. EGCG will help control mTOR. If you like black tea, theoflavin uh, is a substance in black tea that also raises AMPK, and by doing so, it helps control mTOR. So, there you go. I've given you quite a few substances. Uh, I should also point out that these uh, sub these natural uh, substances that I just mentioned will also stimulate autophagy, and by doing so, will replicate a lot of the longevity benefits you get from caloric restriction without the necessity of having to reduce your calories, your, your average calorie intake by 30%, which is beyond the ability of most people. I mean, there was a study a couple of years ago where they tried to uh, test people. They put people on the uh, on the uh, calorie restricted diet. They started out with, uh, I think it was 25% uh, reduced calories. People couldn't do it. After a week, they, they just couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. So they wound up going down to 12%. Uh, uh, all the people could do was restrict their calories to 12%. They couldn't handle more than that. But even 12% led to some notable health benefits, including increased insul insulin sensitivity, lower blood glucose, and lower blood lipids like cholesterol and, uh, and LDL. So, uh, you know... And again, the mechanism would probably be a combination of an increase of proteins called sirtuins along with a, a depression of, of uh, mTOR and an increase of AMPK. So, you know, uh, the, you, you can try that. I mean, if you, if you keep your, uh, generally speaking, you should actually reduce your calories as you age. Uh, or you can do something like intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting will also raise AMPK. And that's one of the reasons why intermittent fasting can duplicate many of the health benefits of caloric restriction. So I think I, I think I covered it there. So you know I think this is an extremely important video. Uh, this is something I'm going to write about much more in depth. 
I'm going to have a, a, a very in-depth article on AMPK because it does a lot of other things that I, I can't get into in this video because it would take too much time. And there's a lot of other aspects of mTOR related to health, such as the way it affects the brain that I, again, don't have time for in this video, but I will be discussing in my Applied Metabolics newsletter. Uh, so you can, you can subscribe to that at www.appliedmetabolics.com. Where I, in, that, in that newsletter, which is 40 to 50 pages every month, I also discuss nutrition, exercise science, hormonal therapy, fat loss techniques that really work, anti-aging research such as this, and much more that you can use today, various nutrition controversies, women's health and fitness, ergogenic aids, hormonal therapy, I think I just mentioned that, and you know, various other topics. There's other digital newsletters that cover exercise and nutrition, but there's not one that I know of that covers the range of topics, nor is there any that have the experience that I have. Uh, that, that can match my years of experience, which is close to 60 years, uh, including uh, approximately 8,500 articles published over the years. None of these people who write these uh, other newsletters are professional writers, and it shows, because there are a lot of their uh, articles read like medical journal articles. They're extremely difficult to read. I, I've been writing for the public for over 40 years. I know how to translate. Uh, anyone who reads my newsletter will tell you I know how to translate extremely technical material and to read, read readable material to the extent that even a person with a sixth grade education will be able to understand and profit from my newsletter. If you're illiterate, uh, well, if you're illiterate, there's ways of using uh, online uh, read text uh, uh, <laughs> read text programs. You can use it with my newsletter where you can have the text read to you. So even the people that can't read can still benefit from applied metabolics. <laughs> but, you know, so... I was going to say something here, but I don't want to get political. <laughs> anyway, so uh, when you subscribe to my Applied Metabolics newsletter, I'll send you an invitation to join my private Applied Metabolics uh, Facebook page. Each day I put new information on nutrition, exercise, science, and medicine. Uh, very interesting articles uh, only for subscribers of Applied Metabolics. I have an email portal on my Applied Metabolics website, again, exclu exclusively for current subscribers, where they can send me short questions about anything they read in the newsletter or any short questions that might have anything related to nutrition or exercise science. Uh, I don't, uh, however, uh, I don't want to get into answering questions about steroid cycles or which steroids to use or where to get steroids. I won't talk about that. Uh, it's not because I'm not a doctor. I just think it's unethical because I don't know who I'm talking to. And I, I, I just prefer, look, there's plenty of other people on YouTube that are willing to talk about that stuff. I don't want to get into that stuff, you know, about uh, how to use steroids. I don't do it. I have had articles that indirectly discuss steroids and applied metabolics. These are from science journals. Sometimes I'll discuss the uh, pre-workout regimes of uh, professional or amateur bodybuilders if they take steroids. I will mention the steroids they use, but I don't give any recommendations. So, uh, you know, subscribe today, www.appliedmetabolics.com. No ads, 40 to 50 pages. I guarantee you'll get some. Uh, you'll learn something in every issue, no matter what your level of education. I promise that. If you want to have the best friend you'll ever have, you go to your shelter and adopt a dog. Adopt a dog. Uh, and for those of you who are curious, if you look up dogs and rapamycin, uh, if you go on a Google search, look up dogs and rapamycin. Uh, you might, uh, if you if you really want to try it, you could probably get your dog enrolled in a study where they'll give the dog, especially the older dogs. It'll give the you know they'll give the dogs uh, small doses of rapamycin, and uh, it may ex uh, extend the life of your dog anywhere from two to three years, but you got to be real careful. Like I said, uh, uh, rapamycin is an immunosuppressant, and the number one killer of dogs is cancer, and a lot of the uh, causes of cancer relate to a lowering of immune response. So it's a, it's a tricky walk. It's a tricky tightrope to walk. So and that's why I haven't given my dog Bruno rapamycin. I'm a little bit worried. I just you know. I don't want to give him something that, you know, could possibly extend his life but kill him at the same time. How do you do that? Anyway, anyway. <laughs> so take care. Thanks for listening.